Steve Stein. How are you, sir? I am good. How are you, Dan? Great, man. Good. Thanks for being here, brother. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to be here. And thank all of you for being here. Uh, if you're watching this live, it's awesome to uh, be spending some time with you. Please tell us uh, what you want to learn in terms of what questions you may have about music theory. We will definitely go back and read those and try to answer them, all your questions in, uh, in, in not only this call, but also or this video, whatever we call these things, uh, and also in any kind of future videos we do. So we're doing a, uh, a week-long music theory workshop. And I'm really excited about it. If you want to learn the fundamentals, just the basics of what you need to know as a guitar player uh, in regards to music theory, stay with us and also subscribe and turn on the notifications so you get notified when these, uh, when the next part comes out. And uh, if you want to learn this stuff even faster, you can go to guitarzoom.com and check out Steve's Music Theory Masterclass, which is an unbelievable masterclass that covers all of this stuff in depth that we're going to be covering this week. But thank you for joining us. And thank you for being here, Steve. Yeah. What is the very first thing that we're going to learn, sir? Okay. So, you know, I, I've taught, you know, Dan and I both went to college and studied music theory and all that sort of thing. But really the, the way that I teach this, this stuff is coming from many, many, many years of guitar students, guitar lessons. And so what I'm going to do over the next week is try and explain to you sequentially how to think about basics, fundamentals of music theory and then how to apply that to your guitar. So the first place we need to start today is we need to understand what the chromatic scale is and burn those notes into your brain so you can then apply that to your fretboard. Because a lot of times people say, well, how, do, how should I learn the notes on the guitar? I don't know what my notes are on the guitar. And while there's... 20 different ways you could actually learn the notes on the guitar. Today what I want to do is I want to explain it to you using this whiteboard and, um, and then reapply that to your guitar so you can actually start learning what the notes are. And most importantly, you know, for me, the, if you have to think too long about anything, chances are the opportunity is now over, right? If you're mm -hmm. jamming with people or whatever it might be, the trick is to know the stuff, not I can figure it out, but to know it. And so that's what I want to talk about today is we're going to start by talking about what I call the dictionary of music, which is the chromatic scale. Very cool. So this is going to help people learn, learn their notes on the fretboard. Absolutely. The right. uh, yeah. And I call it the dictionary of, of music because if you think about the dictionary, the dictionary more or less has all the words in it, but it doesn't make any sense. It's just all the words. Well, we need to know all the notes to be able to create scales and modes and chords, which we are going to talk about all of that stuff over the next seven days. Um, but in order to do that, we really need to know what those notes are. So that's what we're going to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is just my own personal opinion about the music theory thing. You know, I've, there's some, there's some thought out there of um, you know, music theory isn't essential. It's not necessary to play. And I would say, correct. It is not necessary to know how to play a guitar uh, to know music theory. I, I grant you that. There's players, I'm sure we could think of some, that uh, were great players who didn't understand the stuff that we're going to cover even in this, this uh, music theory workshop. However, there's another part of that argument. And, and, and I would also say that if you're just starting out, like if you're just trying to figure out how to, you know, where to place your fingers on the fretboard, like how to play a G chord, uh, do not. Do not worry about any of this stuff. No, okay? that's I just right. want to get that right that's out. <laughs> We've got like, if you're just starting out, like if you're a beginner guitar player um, and you're just trying to figure out like how to get your left and right hand working, how to fret chords, you know, if you still are feeling like sore fingers and stuff because you're, you know, you're building up the calluses on your finger. If that's where you're at, this is really not for you. Okay. And I don't, I don't want to be really clear that not, people not to get overwhelmed and think, oh my gosh, I got to learn all this stuff. No, you don't. You don't have to know all of this to play your guitar, okay? Now, now that I've said that, <laughs> let me say this other thing. I wanted to get that out of the way first. In my own experience, and Steve, you can agree or, or not with this, uh, musicians, what, what theory really does for you, it is the language of music. And it's the way that musicians communicate with each other. So if I say, hey, Steve, this is a one, four, five chord progression in the key of G, he instantly knows which chords those are. And if there's a keyboard player, that keyboard player knows. If there's a trumpet section, they know. If there's a, a bass player, he knows like exactly 
the the idea the harmonic idea that this whole entire uh song that we're about to play what it is so when you know the language it gives you a whole new level of confidence not only to play to learn music whatever style you want you can go learn any style you want because now you actually speak the language and also it gives you the ability to communicate with other musicians and it's really great for your confidence when you walk into a uh, do you get in a setting with other musicians who know this stuff and they're like, yeah, this is a minor ninth chord. And you're like, oh yeah, okay, minor ninth is just a minor triad plus a ninth. Okay, I know exactly what that is. That just makes your confidence go way up versus hearing a bunch of people talk about this stuff and you're like, oh, I better keep my mouth shut because I'm embarrassed I don't know this stuff, right? So you don't need it to play. However, if you want to, you know, like what kind of separates people you know not to put it too harshly but people who really really know this stuff and play versus people who kind of play around with the with the guitar this is one of those things so hopefully you'll get a ton of benefit out, benefit out of it and um if you are interested in learning this and really leveling up your understanding of what guitar is and music and how it works and everything stick with us for the series because it's going to be super powerful and the stuff that i wish i had known when i was probably 13 or 14 years old that i didn't learn until i was in my 20s can I piggyback on that with a bit of agreement and disagreement? Sure. Kind of. When I was learning how to play, I learned how to play by ear. And I learned how to play songs that I liked by Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and Ozzy and all those sorts of things. And music theory, it wouldn't have served any purpose at that point in my journey. Um, because I wasn't, I didn't need to to jam. I didn't need to improvise with people. I was just learning songs. And when I would get together with people in jam, we were jamming songs that we already knew. Um, so early on, you know, and again, theory is such a weird thing because theory, like, you know, we could say, well, Angus Young doesn't know theory. Maybe and maybe not. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say he knows a lot of theory where he can use a bunch of the language, but if he understands the concepts in his head, that's still theory. And I've always referred to that as guitar theory. Like I knew when I was younger, I knew guitar theory. If the song was A minor, I knew I could use A minor pentatonic, right? But I didn't know any bigger concepts on top of that. So I think if, if you're with us right now, the reason is because you want to know theory and you probably want us to get started anyway. But I'm just telling you that for some players, theory isn't where they need to be at this stage in their game. But I will agree with Dan that at some point in my playing, when I started getting together with other musicians that I wasn't so, they weren't my buddies, right? Situations where I was, maybe didn't know everybody or I had to get up and play with, with other people. And it was real. Now all of a sudden it was a real musical situation that I was finding myself in. And I, again, I don't mean disrespect by saying real. It's not like jamming with my buddies on stage wasn't real. It's one of the greatest freaking things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> But there's other times where maybe I've gotten hired to do music. I've gotten hired to write music with somebody or write a solo or come up with a chord progression or different things like that. And that's where all of this really started playing into it. Um, you know, where I have some friends that are really into jazz. Well, there's, there, it's very difficult to play jazz if you don't have knowledge of things. So my point is, is, is depending on where you are in your journey, there are elements of theory that you are gonna find absolutely pointless and then there's parts of theory that I believe you're going to find absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. So that's what the next seven days are really about, is trying to give you the most crucial elements that I think any guitar player can benefit from if you're ready for theory. Like Dan said, if you're just learning how to play a G chord, I don't know that you need to know what the circle of fifths is. Okay? Right. You know, but, but if you're further along and you want to know, hey, I, you know, I'd love to learn arpeggios. What is a triad? I don't understand what that is. Or what notes are in a D minor chord? I don't get it. Well, that's functional, practical music theory. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next, next week. So I love it. Yeah. Well said, my friend. So guys, yeah, I think that's enough introduction on this stuff. I, I, there's just, you have to figure out where you are in your journey. How does this apply to you? I would just caution you if you're starting out, don't get overwhelmed. And, but if you're interested and you're like, yeah, I've always wondered about that, this is for you. You're definitely going to enjoy this. And if you want to take it just to uh, the other level, it's, uh, you'll want to get Steve's masterclass, Music Theory Masterclass, which is available at guitarzoom.com. So, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm singing. Theory, yeah, yeah, yeah. In music theory, we need to know the notes. 
Now, in music theory, the notes are A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. There's no such thing as an H or a Q or an L or a P or a Z. It just goes through A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And I often tell people, if you kind of think about it like a circle, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? They just kind of rotate over and over and over around in a circle. It doesn't matter. In music, you can start on A and we call it the key of A. Or you can start on B and we call it the key of B. Or we call it, you know, start on C, we call it the key of C. And again, we'll get into that further down the line. But you have to understand that if I write it out like this, it looks like A is the most important note. I'm just putting it like this because A is the beginning of our alphabet. Okay? I could have very easily wrote out, written out, excuse me, these seven notes starting with B or starting with C or starting with D. It doesn't make any difference. Okay? And if you think about, for instance, a piano, if you've seen a piano before, which I'm sure you have, there are lots of keys on that, okay? Those keys are these notes over and over and over again in what we call octaves. And again, we're going to get into that a little bit further as we keep going. But I just need you to understand that this kind of wheel just keeps going. Like our, our guitar has a lot of A's and B's and C's and D's and E's and F's and G's all over it, okay? Yeah. So, let, me, let me make one uh, observation, Steve, yep. just, to make, just to clarify in case anybody's watching this and they might have this question. And by the way, guys, if you have questions, please put them in the comments. Uh, let us know uh, w w where your head's at and what you need answers on. Uh, so I think what I heard you say, Steve, is that there are only seven notes we need to worry about, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Yeah, for this two minutes, yes. We have yes. more coming, but yes. <laughs> and then, and they don't always have to appear, appear in that order. They don't always have to start with A. Correct. The, okay. So I can start with B. You know, this yeah, if, you B. Think that the, if you don't understand what the word key of, the key of G means, it's okay because we're going to get into that. But the key of G would say, hey, the, the first note, the primary note that we're going to use in this particular musical situation is going to be G. Or the key of B, the first note, the, 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 the B is going to be the primary place. And I always think of it like a baseball diamond. Like home, home plate is B or G or D or whatever. And we're going to go other places, but we're always coming back to home plate. Love it. Yeah. And if you're sitting there and you're, 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 you're like, well, what about sharps and what about flats and all that? Don't worry about that. We'll get it to it. We'll get to oh, it. We're, we're, getting we're laying it. the foundation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, okay. So I'm going to go for a little while here. Just let me kind of go and build this thing out. Okay. Go ahead, buddy. So we've got A through A. All right. Now that's seven notes. A, okay. It's just showing you that it's repeating again in, in octaves. And let me show you this once. Can you see that piano right there, Dan? Yeah. Okay, so this is just a small segment of what the piano would look like. Now, those big white notes right there would be the notes A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. But they'd be organized in a certain way. So, for instance, if we look at this picture right here, the first key there would actually technically be C. Now, it's okay if you don't play piano. I don't play piano. But this is what they would look like on the piano, okay? You'd have the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. Now, after that B, of course, the piano is a lot longer than that. After that B, it would just start all over with C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the entire white notes on the piano are the notes A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, A, B, C, over and over and over across the piano. Okay? So this is just showing you what I'm going to call the octave, which means we've gone through those white notes and we're starting all over again. Okay? Now, in between... Those white notes, what you're going to notice are there are black, white keys, I should say. In between those white keys, you have black keys. Okay? Now, those black keys are a little bit different. Those are called accidentals or sharps or flats. So, for instance, if you look at the first one there, we have C and D, right? And in between the C key and the D key, we have that little black key right there. That little black key is what we call C sharp. C sharp. Okay? Now, again, don't worry about flats and all that. I'm going to explain all of that to you. But just understand that between the notes C and D, you actually have another note, which is called C sharp. Now, C sharp is independent of C and D. Okay? It seems like it should be related to C, but it really isn't. It's its own person. C is a person. C sharp is also a person. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, if we keep going with this logic and we said, okay, so if we had seven white keys... And if we gave each one of these notes a black key, 
we'd have seven black keys, we'd have 14 notes. Because we'd have seven white keys and seven black keys. So seven plus seven, of course, is 14. We don't get 14. We only get 12. And the reason is, is because whoever made up this stuff was trying to make this complicating for us. Just like <laughs> I've thought that about a million times. <laughs> what you're going to notice is between the E and F, okay, you see that? There's no black key. All right? Now, if I was to show you this picture, this is going to show you a, kind of an elongated picture of the piano there, okay? But you're also going to notice that between the E and F there, there's no black key like we talked about. But if we move over to the next C, you're going to notice that B would be in front of it and there'd be no black key there either. So for me to simplify this for you, this is how I learned this when I first went to college because I didn't understand anything about music theory and all of a sudden I was just bombarded with all this crap, right? So what I did in my head is I thought, here's what I got. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Everybody gets a sharp. And again, don't worry about flats. We're going to come to that. Everybody gets a sharp except for B and E, which spells the word B. Mm -hmm. B and E do not get sharps. It spells the word B. B and E do not get sharps. So if you think about it, all of these notes would get sharps, and I'm going to write them down for you, except for B and E. B Remember and the e. word B. So D and E, we're going to get a D sharp. E and F, we're not going to get anything. F and G, we're going to get an F sharp. G to A, we're going to get a G sharp. A to B, we're going to get an A sharp. And then here we go again. B to C, we get nothing. Mm. Okay? And I'm even going to mark that right here if you can see that yeah okay, let me so make one back. what's that let me, let me come on to one thing that steve's talking about when uh just in case you're sitting there like keys key signatures keys on the piano so there's two different things just to make sure you understand when he's saying keys right now on the piano you know the notes the actual keys that you press down the little levers on the piano that you press to make a sound on the piano those are called keys that has nothing to do with key signatures. No, we're not there yet. We're, we're not. not in key signatures. We're saying keys right now. The only thing you need to think about is just those white or black notes on the actual piano. Okay, right. those are called keys. Just want to make sure that we're not talking about key signatures. We're not talking about keys, right. you know, which, which key we're in. We're right. just talking about the keys on the piano, just in case anybody was confused about that. And guys, if you have any questions, please pop them in the comments box. Okay, Go ahead, so... Buddy. Okay, so now if you think about it, the first thing you need to do, and this is really important, is you need to get an understanding in your head that you have A, A sharp, B, nothing, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, nothing, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. Okay, and you just got to get used to thinking about that. Again, you don't need to play piano to know this. I don't play piano, and... I only use the piano keys as a reference for you if you're familiar with that. You can very much use just the guitar reference in your head, but you have to understand, and again, the easy way to think about this is all the notes get sharps except for B and E. Now again, once you've been doing theory for nine years, you could argue with me that B can have a sharp and E can have a sharp and all that kind of stuff, but today, right now, it just confuses things because we can see when we look at that piano keyboard, okay, we can see that there's no black key in between there, and that's what we're talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I want to do next is I want to take this idea right here, and I want to apply it to your guitar so it, it makes sense practically for you, okay? Mm -hmm. Now. And by the way, guys, if you're, if you're ever wondering why we mm -hmm. start out with a piano, it's because in every college um, on earth, if you sit down and start, when you first go into any class, you've got music majors who are voice majors, marimba majors, percussion majors, um, tuba majors, guitar majors, piano majors, and everybody's in the same class. And so every single theory teacher, you start with the piano and you have to pass a piano proficiency exam. And so everybody, the piano is used to like explain all this stuff. That's why Steve's beginning with that. Right, right. And remember, I mean, obviously some of you will <clears throat> not go to college and study music like Dan and I did, right? So that's why you always want to try and figure out a way to make it make sense in your head, the, the, the best way that, that you can make that work, right? Um, and so, yeah, so I use a piano as a reference, but really, like, when I look at my guitar, this is what I'm seeing, okay? These are the notes that I'm seeing on my guitar. 
And so again, if I look at my guitar, the first thing I need to know is when I pluck a string, like the sixth string, I have to know what note is being created. So if you don't know the names of your six strings, obviously you're gonna need to know that. So when I pluck the sixth string, I'm hearing the note E. Okay, this is an E string. So I'm hearing the note E. I'm just tuned regular, like standard tuning we call it, so this is E. Okay, now I don't have another camera angle to switch because my camera is actually pointed over there, but. We can see um, your neck when you do that. Yeah, you can see a little bit of it, yeah. So it, when, I, when I'm like this, okay, when I pluck this string, this sixth string right here, you hear E. When I go to the first fret, I'm raising the sound by one. Okay, now again, we're going to get into intervals, distances, but right now, let's not worry about that. Let's just think about the distance from E to its next available note is one. Well, E doesn't get a sharp. We know that because of B and E. So F is the next available note. So when I pluck the sixth string, I hear E. When I press on the first fret, I hear the note F. So for the right, this is E, and this is F. E, F. Okay, now if I keep going, we have F sharp, because that's the next note, right? E, F, F sharp. And I know it's written kind of small up here, right? And, and it's a black key, which is littler than the white key and all that kind of stuff. But in music, it doesn't matter. F and F sharp are equally as important to each other, okay? I'm just showing you that, that F sharp exists between the F and G. But don't ever under, underestimate that, you know, F sharp might be less important than F or something like that. They're mm -hmm. all equal. So as I play E and then F, and I'm going to move up here so you can see this better. So F and then F sharp. And then think about it. What would be the next note? What comes after F sharp in our chromatic scale? You should say G, G. right? F sharp to G. And then G sharp. And then A. Okay, so now I'm here again. A is A is A is A is A. It doesn't matter what octave you're in. Okay, I'm on A right now. So I'm right here. Mm -hmm. So the next available note is A sharp. B. Now I gotta be careful again, because if I'm on B, the next note is C. Now don't try and, f if you don't know the notes on your guitar, I'm gonna make this way easier in about two minutes. Okay, so B, C, because there's no B sharp, C sharp, D, D sharp, and then E. When I get to the two dots, that's an octave, just like we were talking about. So E is right here. Well, E is also right here. So zero and 12 are the same note, one octave difference, E and E, which means one and 13, two and 14, three and 15, which is kind of hard to reach on my acoustic guitar, but you get the point. They're just octaves. So I always teach people, let, let's learn up to 12. Because after 12, especially on electric guitar, you've got all those other things, you're just dealing with an octave of the same notes, okay? Mm -hmm. So even on the guitar, just like the piano, we can play multiple octaves of different things, just like the piano can, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I used to do is I would take the students and I would explain all this to them and I'd go, I'd say, okay, go home and memorize those notes, right? Use that knowledge that you now have and memorize those notes. So then they'd go home and the next week they'd come back and I'd say, okay, let's go through your notes. And I'd say, okay, find B. And here's what they do. They'd go, B. Okay, find D. I don't know if they're actually whispering or not, but <laughs> and they would find D, right? So I'm like, okay, well, that's not working because I don't want you to count up. I want you to know them. I want someone to say to you, where's D? Boom, you say 10th fret. That's what right. I want, okay? So yes, we know this and we need to memorize this and we need to always remember that there's B and E. No sharp on B, no sharp on E. We need to know that, okay? But when we go to our guitar and start memorizing this, there's an easier way to do this that I learned a long time ago. What we're gonna do is take the odd numbered frets on your guitar, which have dots on them. Now, your guitar might be like mine where you don't have a dot on the uh, first fret. Sometimes guitars do, sometimes they don't. Heck, sometimes they don't even have a dot on the, uh, on the third or the fifth fret, but on my guitar, I have a dot up on the top here, but you can't see it right here, 
okay? So your guitar is going to have whatever. It might not have any dots. You might have a really complicated guitar, but if it has dots, use those. So you've got one, <laughs> I like three, dots. Five, <laughs> one, three, five, seven, and nine. And now you're knowing why those dots are there is the reference points for our eyes to be able to see where we're going because we're looking at the top of the guitar when we play, right? We're not turning the guitar like this. We're looking at the guitar on the top. So I want one, three, five, seven, and nine. One, three, five, seven, nine. And of course, I want to be able to find three, seven, Five, nine, one. I want to be able to find those. So now watch this. This is super cool. So if we go back to the sixth string, we know it's E. If we go to the first fret, we know it's F. For the rest of our life, this note is F. So the first fret is F. One is F. One is F. One is F. Somebody asks you where F is, you go to the first fret. Somebody asks you where E is, you plug it open. Okay. Second fret we said was F sharp, but let's not worry about that right now. Let's go to the third fret, which is a dot. That third fret is G, F and G, F and G, F and G. First fret is F, third fret is G, first fret is F, third fret is G, open is E. Have somebody ask you that question, say, what's at the first fret? You say F. What's at the third fret? You say G. You don't have to be in a hurry for this, because once you learn it and you really know it, you know it for the rest of your life. Okay, so F and G, one and three. Always make a reference to the note and the fret number. F is 1, G is 3, 3 is G, F is 1, right? However you want to do, think about it. We go to the 5th fret, this is going to be A. F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A. So the 5th fret is A. For the rest of your life, this is going to be A. F, G, A, 1, 3, 5. F, G, A, 1, 3, 5. See how easy this is? Go to the 7th fret, believe me, it's B. F, G, A, B. One, three, five, seven, F, G, A, B. Well, we've already learned half the, the, the string already. So where's yes. B, seven? Where's A, five? Where's G, three? Where's F, one? And you don't even need a guitar to say that. If, I've always told people, if you, can, if you can see it, you can play it. You gotta mm -hmm. see it in your head. What's at seven? B. What's at three? G. What's at A, five, right? You gotta know it, whether you're saying one, three, five, seven, or you're saying F, G, A, B. Doesn't matter, you gotta be able to twist them. Because a lot of people, they go, well, where's 19th fret? And they gotta count up. Well, you gotta know where 19th fret is, mm -hmm. right? Just like you gotta know where third fret is. So F, G, A, B. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. I'm on B. I know B doesn't have a sharp. So B is at the seventh fret, it's a dot. C is at the eighth fret, which is not a dot, it's a space. C sharp would be at the ninth fret, which is a dot. And then D would be on the other side of that dot right here. So I remember teaching this little girl a long time ago, and it's still in my brain, and I always talk about it. I was doing this and explaining to her 1, 3, 5, 7, F, G, A, B. But C and D surround that dot. They're not on the dot. They surround the dot. And she goes, you know what? That looks like rabbit ears. <laughs> and ever since then, and this was probably 25 years ago, ever <laughs> since then, this is rabbit ears to me. Nice. So F, G, A, B, C, and D. F, G, A, B, C, and D. 1, 3, 5, 7, 8, and 10. 1, 3, 5, 7, 8, and 10. You do that over and over and over, and I guarantee you by tomorrow, you'll know where those notes are on the guitar. Mm -hmm. Okay? So where's C? 8. Where's G? 3. Where's A? 5. You following me so far? Yes. Okay, so here's, here's the really cool part now. Once you've memorized those, and you don't need to be in a hurry, if you try and learn too much at once, you're going to get confused. So learn one, three, five, seven, eight, and ten rabbit ears. One, three, five, seven, eight, and ten before you ever worry about this next step. But once you've got those, understand F and G. I've memorized these. I got them burned in my brain. Well, what's between F and G? F sharp. It's sitting right there. Well, you know what else? You also have G flat. F sharp and G flat are two different names for the same note, which we call an enharmonic, okay? You can call this note F sharp, or you could call this note G flat, and it's gonna be the same thing. So the cool thing is once you really learn where F and G are, you know what's in between there, F sharp or G flat. So on my board here, if we think about it, this F sharp could have also been G flat and flats written with a little a little b okay think of a flat tire it goes down sharp goes up flat goes down right 
So if we think about um, F sharp, we're moving up. If we think about G flat, we're moving down. So that note right there has two different names. And for now, it doesn't matter whether we call it F sharp or G flat. When you start learning your keys and all that stuff, it's going to make a difference. But right now, it doesn't matter, man. If you told me to play G flat, that's where I'd go. If you told me to play F sharp, that's where I'd go. Okay? Now, F to G, G to A, G sharp, A flat. A and B, A sharp, B flat. B to C, we know there's nothing in between there. If we go to our rabbit ears, C to D, C sharp, D flat, and so on. So if that makes sense to you, that's what you do is you memorize those. So instead of trying to memorize all 12 of them and count up, just memorize what I call your prime notes. E, F, G, A, B, C, D. Memorize those notes on your sixth string and know them like the back of your hand and then start thinking about what's in between. Because even by proxy, you can figure out what, where F sharp is if you know where F is. Mm -hmm. Even if you didn't really memorize it, if you needed B flat, if you know, if you know where B is, seven. B flat's one down. And after a while, you just get used to where that is. So that's how we can apply this logic to this instrument. And we can do that with each string. Obviously, as long as we know what the string starts with, we can do it in each string. And it's either going to wind up being on a dot or it's going to be rabbit ears. We're, you're going to wind up doing one or the other. It's, the notes you want are either going to be on the space or on the dot. And every string is a little different. Like people think, well, the dots are there for E, F, G, A, B. They're not. Right? The dots are just there as a visual tool for us as guitar players to see where the ninth fret is. We've already learned that it's not consistent because we have rabbit ears. C and D surround that dot. So don't think that the dots are always lining up with A, B, C, and D. It doesn't work that way. We have to learn those. But the one thing I will uh, caution you on is if you're not one billion percent cool with the notes on the sixth string, don't start on the notes on the fifth string mm, that's and then the fourth advice. string because you're just going to get lost. That's great advice. Don't do that. Even if you spent a whole week, even if you spent a whole month learning the sixth string, in six months, you'd know all your notes, right? Where there are people that have been playing for 10 years and don't know their notes on the guitar. That's right. You know what I mean? Even if it Chunking took you a freaking year to learn each one, in six years, you'd have all strings, right? <laughs> I'm just saying, you could, you could do it in a lot less time than that if you applied this logic and you weren't in a hurry. Yeah. Okay. Guys, when you're, uh, please put your comments in down there. Let us know if you have questions about this. Uh, this stuff can, can be confusing and overwhelming when you're first starting out. Of course, this is our music theory workshop series. Uh, this is really the first part of it. And um, as we publish these, we'll link up in a playlist and you can watch all of them on YouTube. Um, if you want to go deep into this stuff, Steve has a masterclass called Music Theory Masterclass. It is an unbelievably helpful course. Uh, it's available at guitarzoom.com. It's one of our best selling courses and people absolutely love it. So if you're interested in that masterclass, taking this stuff to a whole nother level, you can check out Guitar Theory Masterclass by Steve Stein at guitarzoom.com. Steve, I did want to ask you, I did want to make sure that everybody understood. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in a million percent agreement with do not worry about memorizing your sharps and flats until you have those prime notes memorized on that sixth string. Okay. And then he was saying by proxy, you can figure out the sharps and the flats when you know those prime notes. And all you need to remember is, for example, if G is sixth string, third fret, if you got the G and you know it's that, that very first dot, or maybe you don't have a dot, but you know it's third fret, third fret sixth string. Um, just remember that sharp raises the note a half step or just one fret yeah. in your guitar. We'll get to, yeah, we'll talk about those, yep. Yeah, yeah, it raises it one fret. So sharps go up in pitch, flats go down. So if, you're, if it's sharp or flat, if it's sharp, it's going to go up. If it's down, I mean, it's flat, it's going to go down. So that's, that's, he said that, but I just want to reiterate, if you're sitting there thinking, well, how do, I, how do I remember sharps and flats? Just get those prime notes and sharp raises it one fret flat lowers it one fret right and don't get hung up on the fact that we have these inharmonic equivalents like f sharp and g flat they're just they're the same they're two different names for the exact same note on your fretboard and you don't need to understand why yet we'll get to that that's a whole nother discussion that you don't need to worry about 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, is, is at the end of the day, music theory, in all honesty, and this is my opinion, is just as screwed up as why we have a K in front of the word knife, right? (laughs) Sometimes you just have to deal with the fact that some things, you know, I've heard people say, had they, had they not named all this, if they had just named them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, it might have been easier. But listen, this is what we have to deal with. So you yeah. just have to get used to the fact that this B and E is part of your world and, and you got to deal with it. I love that analogy, Steve, because <clears throat> I really think music theory is a language, and especially guys, if you've studied any type of other language, which most people outside the U.S. learn other languages <laughs> with the U.S. are super lazy. But if you've ever studied even, you know, something like Spanish or Italian or German or whatever, when you're first starting out, you're like, this makes no freaking sense at all. This is not like, it's not resonating with me. Why in the hell do you have like putting the, the modifier after the noun? Like, why is it not a white chair? Why is it chair white? This doesn't make any sense. It's because that's the way that language has been going on for thousands of years. So you have a couple of options. You can either be upset about it or you can just accept the fact that that's the way it is. And guys, we're dealing with something. The medieval ligature system was invented, I think, in the 800s. When these medieval monks, uh, St. Gregory, Pope St. Gregory said basically, hey, guys, we need to learn how to write all this stuff down instead of this is an oral tradition so that you could pass it along to other people in other parts of the world. That's where all this stuff's come from. It's from the 800s all the way down to now. This stuff is, we're not making this stuff up. It's not, it like came out a couple years ago. <laughs> So it ain't changing. So you can just accept it right now and just. Yeah. And for, and for what, you know, the, the, the kind of irregularities that you're seeing, they actually work out in the long run. Yeah. But like I said, you just, you just have to, you just have to accept it and understand it. You know, there's nothing about guitar, but then there's nothing about life that really is very absolute anyway. <laughs> um, so, so as we keep going, there, there, <laughs> there will be. It's turning so into we'll, philosophy class. Yeah, well, listen, this is all awesome. guys, man. We know that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is what I, what I really want to, to, to drill home is that, for me, I've always tried to think that there's practical things like tomorrow when you join us again, we're going to talk about something that's really practical that you can really use. Um, because when I was a kid, I would look at this stuff and go, well, why do I need to know it? And the truth mm. is, when I was a kid, I didn't need to know it right. because I wasn't in a place where it was something that I needed to know. Since then, since I started learning some of these things, it, it has really helped out enormously in my understanding and my ability. This is the big thing is my ability to react quickly and get a more right answer. I can't say it's always a right answer because I screw up just like everybody, but, but it's more right than it would be by just guessing. So that's why we're learning these things is it would, you know, if you think about just the practicality of learning the notes on your sixth string, now you'd be able to find all your bar chords. So if somebody said, hey, we want F sharp minor, well, now you know where F sharp is. Of course, you need to learn your bar chords. And, or if somebody said, hey, we're gonna be in the key of B Dorian. Well, if you knew what Dorian meant, you could go to B and you're ready to go, right? Now, again, there's, there's a million ways to approach things on the guitar. The guitar is like this crazy Pandora's box that goes on forever. I always tell people that the guitar will win. You will, you will be six feet under before you ever figure it all out. Because <laughs> I tell you, it's just every day I wake up and it's like, oh my gosh, there's more. But, yeah. but these things are, are concrete, practical things that you can really use in your playing. And I'm going to stop talking because I know we're getting really long here. No, this is great, dude. I think if there's not, like, if you have one assignment from this, uh, like, what's the most practical thing that they need to do when this is over? Like, what do they need to do next in terms of like well, what they learned today? Okay. What so do they need to do? Here's what I would say is, is f- to prepare for tomorrow for the next video. Okay. For the next thing that, that Dan and I are going to do here. I want you to know this, whether or not you apply it to the guitar, you've got time. Again, you don't have to panic and try and get all this done by tomorrow, but I want you to understand this concept in the ver- at the very least, be able to think in your head, okay, A through G, everybody gets sharps except for B and E. Okay, just that. And we understand that there's a flat and all that sort of thing, but don't let that derail you right now. Just at the very least think A through G, everybody gets sharps except for B and E. And then as we keep going, this stuff's going to start. Ooh, that rhymes. Up. Yeah. Yep. Say that again. It rhymes. Oh, I didn't even know what I said. You said A through B, everybody gets sharp. You, you said A through, a through G, G, everybody gets sharps except for B and E. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and That's easy to remember. And the big thing is, is B and E, it's B. It's the word B. Yeah. That's all you got to remember is the word B. 
you know, let's be honest, guys, if you sit down for 15 minutes after watching this video or just go back, sit down with your six string, and just play open and just go E, 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 hit it like four times and then go to the first fret six string, F, 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 F. Saying it, connecting your wrist with actually practicing it will help you connect the dots and th those little neurotransmitters in your brain. Well, and if somebody can memorize. ask you, even if it's they, the person that asks you doesn't even have to understand what they're asking you. Yeah. You just write down on a piece of paper, ask me where A, B, C, D, E, F, and G is in different orders. Ask mm -hmm. me what's at zero, one, three, five, seven, eight, and 10 rabbit ears. Just ask me what's at eight and you need to say C. What's at three? And you need to say G. Or where's G? Third fret. Where's C? Eighth fret. Learn it both ways because it starts here. The, the thing about teaching, and again, I'm not going to get all off on a tangent for you, but people forget it doesn't start with your fingers. It starts with your brain. It starts with your visualization and understanding of what it is that you're trying to do and transfers to your fingers. You cannot make a G chord if you cannot see it in your head. If you have to keep looking at a piece of paper to figure out G, you will never learn G. And you certainly mm -hmm. won't learn how to play a song. Mm -hmm. At some point, you got to move away from the paper and put it in here. And right. when you can see it in here, then you can start the process of learning the technique, the art of building things on the guitar. Because this is a whole other thing. Like, we're talking about theory. We're not talking about finger exercises. We're not talking about strength exercises. We're not talking about technique. There's a billion things aside from music theory, obviously, right? But we are talking about the logic, the understanding, and the application. That's so, right. Yep. Yeah, that's one of the things I loved about school was, you know, <clears throat> from day one, guys, you, you know, if you're a music major, the, from very from the very first time you show up. In fact, I sucked so bad at this stuff because I had taken piano all my life and I uh, played uh, guitar. But I never learned any of this stuff. I mean, maybe a smidgen. I showed up and I had, I, you, they take, you have to take an assessment test to enroll. And when I took the test, I was like in remedial theory, I, I was, which I didn't even get credit for because it was, it was a prerequisite. Like, oh, dummy, if you can't even come in to start with music theory one, you're screwed. Like you need to go over here and do this remedial class before you can even enter. And then once, <clears throat> once I took, like the, got the foundational stuff, which is what we're covering right here, the application of it, you're taking all that stuff simultaneously. So you're going to all of your, um, your performance classes, your teachers, you're doing performances and everything while you're learning all the theory. So when you're in school, this stuff is just like constantly in your brain. So um, don't, I get the point of that story is don't think that you have to stop playing or stop having fun or whatever to, and then just focus on this. It needs to be a both and. Go learn the notes on your fretboard, watch this video as many times as you want, memorize those notes on your six string, get the flats and the sharps into your head and actually know what they are on the six string and don't even worry about the other strings yet. Um, but in addition to that, also continue playing because that's where it's fun. And then right. as and, you're playing, you right. can start and, and, seeing it. And again, I know, I know we need to wrap this up, but I, the key to theory for you, unless you're way far into this whole thing, you got to find a way to make it practical. Because I used to teach students that would come in and they'd know how to play a major scale on the guitar. They have no idea why they know it. They have no idea why they're even learning it. Just they learned it from a book or some teacher showed it to them. So they don't know how to play, you know, TNT by ACDC, but they know how to major, play a major scale, but they have no idea why they know it. For me, the, the point of music theory is you've got to find a reason to make it practical. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it, it makes for a good book. Like you can sit That's around, right. and, you know, I, I meet people all the time that can talk theory, but when you put an instrument in their hands, they have no idea how to make the correlation. And the trick is you got to make that correlation. Even if you can talk deep, heady theory, that's great and it might be something you're really interested in and I, I think that's really important but more important is take something that you can actually use on your fretboard like tomorrow what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about taking this idea and developing it into an actual scale that we need to know to be able to learn all of our chords all of our scales all of our keys all of our modes it's really important and it's not just like again when i was learning how to play iron maiden I didn't give a crap about a major scale. Iron Maiden sure. didn't use a major scale, but they do. I just didn't understand it at the time. I didn't understand how it worked. Right.
And Steve, this has been awesome. Guys, thank you so much for being here. I know this stuff is heady and like, what's happened? Just it, This is the foundation, guys. So if you want to go back and watch, please do that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your comments. Um, the, one of the greatest compliments you can give uh, Steve is to share this video with someone that you think might benefit. Um, someone else might be like, you know what? That was super helpful. Share it with them. That would be cool. Please subscribe. Please turn the notifications on so you can be notified of when the next live stream happens. I uh, hope you'll enjoy it. And if you want to get the full masterclass, Music Theory Masterclass by Steve Stein, it's available at guitarzoom.com. Awesome. Very cool. Hey, Steve, this has been super, super cool, man. And thanks, yeah, been everybody. Yeah, take care, everybody. And I'll talk to you. I guess we'll be back tomorrow, right? Yep. All right, See cool. you then. Look See for ya. it. Bye.